You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 27, 2020, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Basics of Allergen Immunotherapy. Our presenter is, yours truly, Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics in the section of allergy, asthma, and immunology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, For our second hour of COLA this morning, um, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Jay Portnoy. Um, Dr. Portnoy is well known in the allergy community. Um, He's written numerous papers, book chapters, given many presentations on many aspects of asthma. He has a a particular um, uh, fondness for um, aspects of the environment and effect on asthma and allergies and done a lot of research along those lines. Dr. Portnoy is um, the one of the former uh, presidents of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Uh, he's also the former chief of the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology at Children's Mercy in Kansas City, um, and now um, has the title of chief of uh, telemedicine um, and has always been an out-of-the-box thinker. So um, Dr. Portnoy um, is going to talk to us this morning about immunotherapy and issue that he or an area that he has a lot of experience in um, and give some tips to um, especially the new fellows who are just starting out. So I'll let you take it away, Jay. Great. Th- thanks, Paul. And yeah, I've always tried to be out of the box, but that's getting harder now because the box is getting bigger. <clears throat> so getting out of that box is harder because, well, necessity is the mother of invention. Here we are doing uh, online conferences. This is actually the 11th year of COLA. Um, last year was our 10th year, our decade. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, and now other programs are starting to do it too. So um, it's catching on, and um, we've got to come up with our next thing to do so we can stay out of the box. The box is now starting to, to incorporate us. Anyway, I was asked to uh, to review immunotherapy basics. I know that Dr. Nelson also talked about subcutaneous immunotherapy, so there will be a little bit of overlap. But it seems to me that when fellows are just starting out, it never hurts to learn a little bit more about immunotherapy since, after all, this is the thing that sort of defines what we allergists do. We we do allergy testing. We give allergy shots. Uh, we, we do lots of other things, too, like like food allergy and so on. But but this is kind of the, the traditionally uh, the mainstay of what allergy practice is. So it's important that allergy fellows become familiar and comfortable with the use of immunotherapy. So these are my disclosures. And these are my learning objectives. I know this is not a CME thing, but I, I'm used to doing this. So I, I just point out this is the uh, immunotherapy practice parameter that was published in 2007. Um, before 2003, immunotherapy or allergy shots was kind of the wild west. Every allergist sort of did did it their own way. Every uh, it, it was it was a uh, cottage industry in a sense. Uh, I could tell how somebody was going to use allergy shots by which program they trained in, because each training program had its own unique way of giving allergy shots, which made it very confusing uh, if you switched from one practice to another. And certainly if patients moved from one practice to another, they had to start all over again because everybody did it differently. So in 2003, uh, the first practice parameter was published, and it, it was really an attempt to try to standardize this approach and make it less uh, less haphazard, if you will, ad hoc. Uh, It was published in the Annals of Allergy, and it defined extracts as something you use to diagnose um, allergies. Uh, Maintenance concentrate was defined as a vaccine because we were using it. We we wanted to emphasize the fact that this was an immunization rather than a desensitization. Um, It was the first attempt to estimate an effective dose for uh, different extracts. How how much do you want to give the patients? And then we wanted to recommend standardized labeling, too, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, By 2007, it was clear that there were some issues that were uh, missing from the 2003 uh, practice parameter. Um, Instead of vaccines, we started to call them immunotherapy extracts. Again, even though we we really wanted to emphasize the immunization effect, these are, in fact, extracts of allergens. So that's what they are. Um, We further defined uh, 
the dose that was effective, cross-reactivity patterns were refined. So instead of using multiple allergens that cross-reacted with each other, choose a representative of each, uh, each grouping. Compatibility was refined. Not all extracts should be mixed with each other. Um, we also recommended patient vials rather than off the board, and I'll mention, talk about what that is in a minute. And then standardized forms for skin testing and immunotherapy were recommended. Uh, and then the uh, third iteration of uh, the practice parameter uh, was published in 2010, and this uh, further refined the recommendations that had been made. Uh, basically, it described new indications for immunotherapy that included atopic dermatitis and also large local reactions to venom stings. If, if somebody has an occupational exposure and gets large local reactions, immunotherapy can reduce those reactions. Also recommended measurement of baseline tryptase for ven venom immunotherapy. Uh, specified that there was no lower limit for initiation of allergy shots as long as the indications are present. And obviously, a three-month-old is probably not going to be allergic to aeroallergens, so would not be, have an indication for it. But, but there's no technically no specific age below which you shouldn't give allergy shots. Although for elderly people, uh, you need to evaluate the risk-benefit if they can tolerate the risk of having anaphylaxis. And also, the wait period after injections was standardized at 30 minutes. That was what was recommended. So what are the indications for allergen immunotherapy? It's indicated for the management of IgE-mediated disorders, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, allergen-induced asthma, atopic dermatitis is now an indication. It does, does respond to immunotherapy if you have allergies, hymenopter and fire ant hypersensitivity. Now, food allergy, we're doing oral desensitization now, but it's not indicated. Uh, immunotherapy using subcutaneous immunotherapy is currently not indicated for food allergy. And mosquito allergy and autoimmune disorders, the, these things come up periodically. But there's really no evidence supporting the uses of immunotherapy for treatment of these conditions. Um, so these are the indications. And it's important when you prescribe an extract of immunotherapy and start somebody on it that you document in your chart why you're giving the immunotherapy. Um, so we, in fact, have this form. It's, it's in our electronic medical record now. And you just check off what the indications are for allergen immunotherapy. Certain things are contraindications. If you have unstable asthma, you should not give an allergy shot to somebody whose asthma is not well controlled because it's an increased risk of a reaction. You need to get the asthma controlled before you can give the immunotherapy. Uh, a patient who has coronary artery or other heart disease makes it less likely they would survive anaphylaxis, which is a foreseeable consequence of immunotherapy. Uh, those people should be started with, with caution. And, of course, the usual beta blockers and ACE inhibitors, those patients also can be given immunotherapy. But, again, you need to use caution and uh, make sure that, that, that you understand what the risks are and that the benefits would outweigh them. Immunotherapy is immunization. It's not just desensitization. In fact, you get immunologic changes. The specific IgE decreases over time to the allergens you're injecting into the patient. A specific IgG, and particularly IgG4, increases. Uh, you get a switch of T from a Th2 to a TH1 phenotype switch, so you switch from an allergen to a more normal immune response. Uh, you get changes in the types of mediators that are produced, and also you get a de decrease in the reactivity of the target organ. So that this actually is immunization. It's been studied. Uh, here's a 2007 Cochrane review. There, there haven't been more recent ones. It, um, but 51 clinical trials uh, evaluated uh, the, the benefit of immunotherapy, and there was a statistically significant reduction in symptom scores and also in medication scores. The conclusion was that it's effective for decrease, decreasing both symptoms and medications. And you can see that most of the immunotherapy studies have been done with dust mite, but with other allergens, there's also a statistically significant difference uh, favoring immunotherapy uh, with this meta-analysis. Uh, immunotherapy um, is superior to placebo in terms of improving symptom scores, uh, and it also uh, reduces the risk of a patient with rhinitis developing asthma. So if you give a patient with rhinitis a placebo, they have a much higher likelihood of subsequently developing asthma than if you give them active immunotherapy. 
So not only does it treat symptoms, but it prevents uh, progression. When we give allergy shots, we're giving shots with extracts. Um, we prefer to use standardized extracts, and uh, Greg Plunka talked about what that is. Um, standardized allergen extracts come labeled as bioequivalent allergy units, or BAUs, or they're labeled as allergy units for dust mite or AMBE1, which is a measure of potency for um, ragweed. It's a major allergen. Uh, so the standardized extracts include cat, dust mite, short ragweed, grass pollen, and hymenoptera. It's not too many standardized extracts. Uh, the rest of them are non-standard, and they may vary widely in their biologic activity, although when you extract a pollen, for example, you, you tend to get pretty much the same thing each time you extract it with some variability. The, the key thing is we make no effort to standardize the biologic activity. It's really just keeping track of how it was produced. Uh, the allergies, of course, should be clinically relevant to the patient. Uh, extracts are also uh, come in different forms. There's aqueous extracts. Uh, aqueous extracts can be stabilized in 50% glycerin, which is what we use for skin testing. That's what gives it the oily uh, sensation when you, when you touch an, a, a skin test uh, reagent. And for allergy shots, they tend to be stabilized in 3% human serum albumin, or HSA, although 10 and as much as 20% glycerin is sometimes also used to stabilize an extract used for immunotherapy. Uh, other extracts uh, are modified. There's allergoids. Allergoids are basically denatured extracts, and they're denatured in formalin. Uh, the idea is that they're less allergenic, but they're just as immunogenic. So you get this benefit, but there's a lower risk of having an uh, anaphylactic reaction from an allergy shot. It's also polymerized extracts using trichloroacetic acid, where you uh, basically create a huge polymer of the allergens. Uh, so there's less on the outside available to bind to IgE. So again, the idea is that you get the same amount of immunologic response without, with the lower risk of having an allergic reaction to it. Uh, you can also give allergy shots with T-cell peptides. Just, just take the peptide in, that binds to the T-cell and use that. Uh, that's been studied for a long time, particularly with cat allergen. It's still under investigation. As far, my understanding is that it still hasn't been shown to be effective, but th there's still work being done on it. And then the use of uh, adjuvants such as immunosimilar sequences has been studied also. Um, uh, in terms of these extracts that we use to give allergy shots, they come labeled with different units, and Greg Plunkett mentioned these. There's weight per volume, which is the most common one, and that basically mentions is how many grams of pollen or so of source material is put into a certain number of cc's of a buffer. Um, so weight per volume just tells you how the extract was produced. Uh, notice that when you when you see a, something labeled as 1 to 10 with a colon, that's the same thing as 1 divided by 10. So it's weight. 1 is the weight and 10 is the volume, weight per volume. Um, there's also uh, this thing called protein nitrogen units um, where they actually measure the amount of protein, the milligrams of protein per milliliter. Uh, that tells you how much is in the vial, but it doesn't tell you the biologic activity. It just tells you the amount of protein. Then there's allergy units per mil. This is the potency of an extract um, in little reference vials that are kept at the FDA. And so there's, there's thousands of little vials at the FDA that are labeled in a certain number of allergy units per mil. If you want to create another uh, new batch of dust mite allergen, which is what this is for, uh, then you uh, get one of these vials and you compare the, the standard vial with your new extract, and uh, you can see what the relative potency is using skin testing. Um, there are obvious issues with that, like what happens when you run out of little vials, um, but, the, the, but this is how it is done right now. Uh, one solution to not running out of vials too fast is the FDA now allows companies to, to make a secondary reference that they keep, and then they use that reference, and that way they don't, they don't get a primary reference very often. They can use their secondary reference to standardize their extracts. There's also bioequivalent allergy units, BAUs, and this is the potency that gives a 50 millimeter erythema. It's, it's back basically 25 by 25, so it's some of the, of the erythemas using intradermal skin tests. Um, micrograms of major allergen, you can measure the amount of major allergen like AMBE1. And then in Europe, they've also used this thing called histamine equivalent prick, and I'm just not going to go over that, but it's interesting. 
The, the major clinically relevant aeroallergens in North America, the indoor allergens are cat, dog, uh, dust mites, and insects, primarily cockroach. So those are the main indoor aeroallergens. Uh, there's also a lot of uh, outdoor aeroallergens, too. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about the different types of extract that can be used to uh, immunize patients. And you'll hear these being used by allergists across the country. Different groups uh, have been trained to do it in different ways. Uh, one of the ways that's uh, commonly done, I think in, in New England and in uh, the Northeast United States, I'm not sure if it's done this way as much anymore, is this thing called off the table or off the board. Uh, when you give an allergy shot using this method, basically a single syringe is used to draw extracts from various files when the patient arrives. So the patient comes in, they've got a formula that tells you what they're allergic to and how much of each thing is in their extract. You take the syringe, you put it into each of the different vials and draw up a small amount. Then you take that same syringe and put it into the next vial and draw up a little bit of that. And you do it from one extract to the next until you're vial is completely constituted, and then you inject that into the patient. Uh, obviously, the problem is that you're sticking the needle through a whole bunch of different rubber uh, stoppers, so the needle gets dull after a while. It's also a risk of cross-contamination from one vial to the other, because you're literally uh, sucking from different vials with a vial that already has stuff in it. Uh, there's an issue um, also with contamination. Um, this is uh, commonly used because you only need to have one set of vials and they get used up quickly so that the vials don't get old. They, they tend to be fairly fresh. Um, there are also shared single vials where you take separate syringes in each vial, but multiple injections are given. So if the patient gets ragweed and tree pollen, you, you have a syringe that you inject them with ragweed and another syringe you inject them with the tree pollen and, and so on. And, and this can also um, be effective but, but again, it's, uh, it, there, there are some disadvantages to this as well. Shared mixtures are, if, if, if a number of different patients tend to get the same extract, like tree mix, um, then you can use tree mix as a common mixture and give that same vial uh, mixture to different patients. So they share the, the mixture. The extract is drawn from one shared vial when the patient's arrived and then they're injected with it, and other patients may get extracts from that same uh, vial. Um, and and there, there's some sense that comes from that, but the most common one that's currently used is at uh, patient-specific vials, where the extract is prepared for each patient based on what their sensitivity is. And this is being drawn primarily by how reimbursement occurs, because CMS now pays for patient-specific vials. You have you pay they they basically pay depending on how much extract you give to a particular patient, and, and they tend not to pay very well for the other types of extracts. And I think reimbursement has kind of forced everyone to, to switch pretty much to patient-specific vials. As a general rule of thumb, you want to prepare patient-specific vials. They're individualized to each patient. Reduces the likelihood of error, too. You make the vial one time, and you're not making it each time they come in, so it reduces the risk of contamination. Uh, you need to include an effective dose of each component. You need to avoid mixing incompatible extracts. Some things really shouldn't be mixed with other things. And you don't want to include cross-reacting allergens because it's, it tends to be redundant. So there's different treatment schedules that are used for immunotherapy. Um, this is uh, divided into uh, build-up phase and maintenance phase. The build-up phase involves the administration of increasing quantities of allergen vaccine subcutaneously. Week after week, they come in, and they get a slightly higher amount each time they come in. Conventionally, that's done about once a week. You can have the patient come in twice a week if you want to. They could even come in every day if they have the time. Uh, this may be practical on college campuses for students who may, you know, stop in between classes at the student health center, for example. Uh, cluster immunotherapy is an accelerated way of giving allergy shots. Instead of coming in once a week, they may come in two or even three times a week. But each time they come in, they get two or more injections per visit. So that's the cluster. Uh, and if you know, they get a shot, they wait 30 minutes. If they're doing well, then they can get another shot. So they, they can, if they have enough time to wait around, they can get several injections per visit. 
And then this thing called Rush or modified Rush, ultra Rush, there's different names for it. It's basically a way of giving allergy shots where you build the patient up very rapidly in either one or one and a half to two days to, to almost a maintenance dose. Um, and this is sometimes used uh, when patients need to uh, rapidly uh, be increased and, and get on a maintenance uh, dose of allergy shots. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that there's a much higher risk of having a systemic reaction because the patient hasn't had a time, had a chance to become immunized to the lower doses of extract that were given. Uh, so the, again, this is the the schedule. You have this build-up phase. You go through different vials. You increase the concentration of the extract each time, and then they go on to a maintenance phase where they go to every two weeks, and then they go to every four weeks for a, a period of time. Um, it's most common. The most com the, the the weekly schedule is the most commonly used, one to two times a week. It takes about 18 to 27 dose increments until the patient gets to a maintenance dose, which is about three to six months. Uh, may de it depends on sensitivity. If they start having reactions and you have to hold the dose or decrease the dose a little bit, it may take longer. It's adjusted for exacerbation of symptoms and lapses in scheduled visits. Uh, they need to be evaluated every 6 to 12 months to make sure that they're doing well on their immunotherapy. Uh, rush and cluster immunotherapy are accelerated. They may provide more convenience, but there is a higher risk of an allergic reaction. This is a cluster schedule. This is visit number one. Patient comes in on this day and they get three injections. Then they come in the next day. That could be the following week or it could be later in the same week. They get three more injections. And you can see that there's a period of schedule of eight different injections until the patient gets up to a maintenance dose. So it's a much faster way of getting on to allergy shots, but it is spread out over eight different visits. A rush schedule, on the other hand, can be done in a single day. Here's the, the time. And after six hours, the patient has basically received uh, an injection of 0.35 cc's. If the maintenance is 0.5, this is close to a maintenance dose. It's almost a maintenance dose. And, and uh, you can see that it's very aggressive, um, but it also is associated with a much higher risk of systemic reaction. So it, it is labor intensive and, and requires uh, your, the, the full attention of your clinic staff. So what I'd like to do now is to go through the process of actually writing a prescription for an allergy extract. Um, this is um, something that each fellow needs to learn how to do in order to graduate from fellowship school. I guess, guess that's uh, what this is, the training program. Um, and um, so we're going to hypothetically write a prescription uh, for an extract that contains each of these things. Normally, you wouldn't mix some of these, like alternaria wouldn't be mixed with uh, with, with uh, timothy grass because there's a there are proteases and alternaria that digest timothy grass so we would normally not mix these together but it, just for illustration purposes I'm going to go through the process of designing an allergen extract that contains each of these components now the first thing we need to know is how what's available but what, what extracts do we have to work with we have cat hair and pelt and the manufacturers produce that at a concentration of either 5,000 or 10,000 BAUs per mil. Uh, we have dust mite, it comes in these different concentrations. We have Bermuda grass, short ragweed, other grasses are standardized, and pretty much all of the other pollens come as either 1 to 10 up to 1 to 40 weight per volume, uh, or in uh, PNUs, depending on which company you get from, get them from and how they're, they're labeled. Uh, in addition, the molds generally are not standardized, so they come in weight per volume or PNUs per milliliter. And we also have an indication of what the probable effective dose is for these allergens. So, for example, dust mite uh, is probably effective if you give between 500 and 2,000 allergy units per injection. Uh, cat, you need 1,000 to 4,000 BAUs per injection, grass pollen, uh, ragweed, and, and so on. And for non-standardized extracts, generally 2.5 to 10 milligrams, or the highest tolerated dose, is considered to be an effective dose for these allergens. If we're going to make allergy shots, we need to do the math. So a little bit of math. Sorry it's in the morning, but maybe uh, math is good in the morning. Um, concentration times volume equals dose. So if we want to inject 5,000 BAUs uh, into a patient, um, see, we need to uh, take the concentration, BAUs per mil, 
and multiply it by the number of mils we're injecting into the patient. In this case, um, for maintenance dose, we tend to inject about 0.5 milliliters into the patient, which means we're only giving half of a mil. And so 10,000 BAUs per mil, we're only giving 5,000 BAUs. We're not giving the full 10,000 unless we inject an entire milliliter, which you could do, but it's, it's a pretty large volume. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Also, what do you do with weight per volume, 1 to 100 weight per volume? That's the same thing as 1 gram per 100 milliliters, 1 to 100, which is the same thing as 10 milligrams per milliliter. Okay, so 1 to 100 times 0.5 milliliters is 5 milligrams. So that's, what, that's the dose you're injecting into the patient if you're using an unstandardized extract that's labeled in weight per volume. If you have X milliliters of an antigen and you add it to a mixture with the final volume of Y milliliters, the final concentration is the initial concentration times X over Y. So let's say we take 0.5 milliliters of a 1 to 10 elm, and we put that into a total of 5 milliliters, which is the size of the vials we tend to use during buildup phase for our patients. So 1 to 10 elm is 1 divided by 10, and times the initial volume, which is 0.5, and the final volume is 5. So it's 0.5 over 5 is 1 over 10, times 1 over 10 is 1 over 100. So the final concentration of the elm is 1 to 100. You're making a tenfold dilution. Okay? So let's, let's start with our extracts. We notice that the first three extracts are unstandardized. Ragweed also comes standardized in terms of AMBE 1 units, but most of the extracts that we get are not standardized. And so these come as a, let's say, 1 to 10. Uh, I, I tried to do the one colon 10, but Excel, which is the program I did this in, doesn't like colons. It thinks it's a time. So, so it's 1 to 10, weight per volume. And we need to know what, how much volume to add to get a total volume of 5 cc's. And then we're injecting 0.5 cc's into the patient at their maintenance dose. How do we, how do we determine how much volume to add to this extract? Well, how much do we need to give of ragweed? Uh, so I'm going to go through a couple of studies that helped us to determine what dose of ragweed was an effective dose. Uh, this is a, a series of studies by Phil Norman at Hopkins. They were done in the 60s, a long time ago. Uh, and basically what, what Norman and his colleagues at Hopkins did was they gave ragweed extract, uh, uh, aqueous extract, or they gave antigen E, which is the same thing as AMBA1. It's the major ragweed allergen. Their question was, uh, do you have to give the whole extract, or can you just give the major allergen? And they compared that to a placebo. They looked at the symptoms of these patients. The green dotted line is the pollen count. As the pollen count goes up, the symptoms go up. And you can see that the placebo patients had slightly more symptoms at the top than either the extract or the purified AMBE-1. Um, but there wasn't that much of a difference, and most of the time it didn't really work. This was a low dose of allergy of ragweed that was given. So the following year, they increased the dose of ragweed, uh, and uh, as you can see, now there's a, higher, a larger difference between the two. Uh, the uh, AMBE-1, the antigen E, and the extract, uh, aller the whole extract, were significantly better at reducing symptoms than placebo. Uh, when the pollen counts were high. But there's not much difference between the aqueous and the uh, purified allergen. The following year, 1968, they did it again. This time they increased the dose still further, and now you can see a much greater difference. Uh, patients on placebo had lots of symptoms. Patients on uh, AMBE-1, the purified allergen, had much fewer symptoms, but the ex aqueous extract was even more effective. And so that, that the conclusion was that, in fact, um, it's better to give the whole aqueous extract than to try to give purified allergen because there are more than one allergen in ragweed extract. And in fact, they were able to come up with this dose response curve where the symptom scores decrease versus placebo as the pr protein nitrogen units, in this case, was increased. So a dose response, it's always nice to see that. And so for ragweed, uh, we know that we want to give a higher dose for short ragweed between 6 and 12 milligrams uh, of AMBE-1 or 1,000 to 4,000 allergy units um, of uh, AMBE-1 of short ragweed. Um, but in this case, we, we know that the ragweed is unstandardized. That's, that's how this uh, manufacturer provides it to us. So we need to do the math. 
And the math here is we have a 1 to 10 extract, which is how it's provided, which is 1 gram per 10 milliliters. And that's 100 milligrams per mil. Okay. Then we want to take point, we want to inject 0.5 milliliters into the patient, and we want the total vial to have 5 milliliters, which means there need to be 10 doses of extract, because 10 times 0.5 is, is 5. And so 10 doses, and we want to inject, the injected dose that we want to shoot for is 2.5 milligrams. Um, so we want to multiply 10 times 2.5 milligrams is 25 milligrams. The extract comes as 25 as 100 milligrams per mil. We determine that right here. So 25 milligrams divided by 100 milligrams per mil is 0.25 milliliters. And so we need to add 0.25 milliliters of each of these extracts to get the final concentration of 200 uh, milligrams. And then we, we uh, get 0.5 cc's of, of that. Uh, so um, this is the total vial from 0 to 5 cc's, and 0.25 cc's, uh, I put that in here just to show you how much of the total, total vial uh, these uh, components fill up. And you can see it fills a pretty small amount, um, but if you, give, if you put 0.25 cc's in there, uh, then you're going to inject 2.5 milligrams into the patient. There's 200 milligrams altogether into, in the 5 cc vial. Okay, so now we need to add grass pollen. Timothy grass comes as 100,000 BAUs per mil, and we want to inject 1,000 BAUs into the patient. How do we know that that's the right dose? A uh, series of studies that were done in, 19, in the 1990s. Uh, here's a study uh, looking at uh, grass pollen allergy with immunotherapy, 40 adults with uncontrolled um, uh, symptoms despite their medications. Uh, they gave a two-month immunotherapy and then monthly maintenance. Um, and this is what they found. This is the pollen count. And then these are the symptoms and these are the drugs of immunotherapy versus placebo. And as you can see, the patients who received placebo had significantly reduced symptoms versus uh, uh, the patients who got immunotherapy had reduced symptoms versus placebo. And also the amount of drugs that were necessary was significantly lower than the uh, placebo group. So there is evidence for effectiveness of grass immunotherapy for rhinitis. So uh, this is a study that compared different doses of immunotherapy. Um, they, they gave either 20 milligrams of FILT P5 or 2 milligrams of FILT P5 or placebo. So they compared high-dose versus low-dose Timothy uh, grass. And these are the symptom reductions. Uh, and you can see that the high-dose had a significantly larger decrease in symptoms versus low-dose immunotherapy. And the amount of medications was also significantly less with high-dose immunotherapy than with low-dose Timothy immunotherapy. Um, one, one trade-off is that high dose was associated with a larger risk of systemic reactions, either early or late systemic reactions with high dose versus low dose. So there's always a trade-off. That's why you don't make the dose go, you know, unlimited in how high you go. You, you go up to a certain amount where there's a trade-off between effectiveness and uh, safety. And so the recommended dose for grass immunotherapy is between 1,000 and 4,000 BAUs. And so that's what we put here. We're going to shoot for 1,000 rather than 4,000 because we have a lot of stuff to put in the vial. So we don't want to put too much of any one, but we want to put enough to get a, an effective dose. Okay, so 0.5 divided by 5 is 10 doses. That's same as before. And we want to put 10 doses of 1,000 BAU, which is 10,000 BAU. That's the total amount we want to put into the vial. The extract comes as 100,000 BAU, which means we only need to put 0.1 milliliters into the vial to get an effective dose. So we put 0.1 of the volume in there, which is 2,000 BAUs um, uh, total. <clears throat> That that's the final concentration. So that way, each time we inject the patient, we're going to give it, get 1,000 BAUs per injection. So that's what the vial looks like. It doesn't take that much Timothy because grass extracts tend to be pretty concentrated. So it doesn't take up much room. And you don't need to add as much Timothy to your extract as you do these unstandardized extracts. 
Okay, the same thing with Bermuda. I'm not going to show you the studies for Bermuda. Bermuda is uh, only comes as 10,000 BAUs, not 100,000 BAUs, but the target dose is only 500 BAUs rather than 1,000. So again, if you do the math, um, you need to add 0.5 milliliters. So we're going to add 0.5 milliliters of Bermuda grass to get uh, to be able to inject the patient with 500 BAUs per injection. And so this is what the vial looks like. There's a lot of Bermuda. It's twice as much as any of these unstandardized extracts. Okay, let's look at dust mite. This is a study done in the 1990s. That's when a lot of these studies were done. And in this case, we're looking at PD-20, which is the provocation dose to get a 20% drop in FEV1. Uh, the allergy extract, this was bronchial challenges with dust mite after the patients have been on allergy uh, in injections. And what you can see is that, the, that it doesn't take very much dust mite to provoke a 20% drop uh, when you give 0.7 uh, micrograms of DERP-P1. When you increase it to a higher dose, then the patient is more tolerant of dust mite. It's a higher PD-20, and then it drops off again. But basically, you need to give at least 7 micrograms of DERP-P1 in order to get maximum effect. Uh, one Downside to going to higher doses is that the systemic reaction rate, in this case a drop of FEV1 greater than 15%, increases as you give a higher dose of extract. So again, there's a trade-off between effectiveness and safety. That's why we don't go to an unlimited high dose. Um, here's a study that looked at uh, uh, dust mite sensitive patients and they gave different maintenance doses. Uh, and basically, in the active group, there was a decrease in symptom scores, the use of medications, and there were increases in FEV1 and FVC. So again, both of these were effective doses based on this study. Um, in addition, the patients clearly could tell the difference between active and placebo. In this case, patients who got placebo said, did you feel that it worked? And they said, no. Whereas patients who got active said, yeah, it was very good or, or good. And so they were more likely to get develop benefit from uh, dust mite allergy shots. So for Durafarini, um, we want to give 10,000, it comes as 10,000 allergy units per mil, and we want to give 500 allergy units. So it's basically the same thing as Bermuda, 0.5 milliliters. So we're kind of getting a pattern here. And this is what the dust mite looks like along with the Bermuda. So you can see that it's starting to fill the extract up now. Now we want to do um, uh, cockroach. Cockroach, unfortunately, is non-standardized. There was an attempt to standardize it, but that didn't pan out, and so we don't have standardized cockroach extract. Uh, so it's basically going to be exactly the same as all of the other unstandardized extracts. So uh, this is variations on a theme. It's not going to be anything different. It's going to be 0.25. Same thing with alternaria. It's not standardized, so it's going to be 0.25. All of these unstandardized extracts are going to be 0.25. So here's the uh, cockroach, and here's the alternaria. Cat. So here's a study that was done again in the 1990s. Uh, 28 cat allergic subjects with asthma were treated for three months with a maintenance dose of 15 micrograms of FELD1 and then saw what happened when they were exposed to a house that had cats in it. Uh, and the active treatment group uh, in placebo, uh, their symptom reduction was not very much but on the placebo, but with the active group, it was 61 before and 17 after. So, so it was a significant decrease in symptoms when they were exposed to a house that had cats in it. Um, and also uh, based by uh, conjunctival and skin reactivity to cat too, they, they actually put drops of cat extract into the eyes and, and saw what happened. That, that sounds painful to me, but they, that sometimes that's done. Um, this is the provocation in the eye. You put uh, cat extract in the eye and see if it turns red. And you can see the patients on immunotherapy were able to tolerate a much higher dose of cat before their eyes turn red than the patients who were getting placebo. So cat extract does work, and there's a dose-dependent effect too. So these investigators gave either 0 0.63 or 15 micrograms of FELD1 by four weeks. And so what they were able to show was that there was a significant uh, improvement uh, in cat 
specific to IgG4, for example, in patients who got uh, the high-dose uh, cat allergen, uh, also the medium, so 15 gave it, five, 3 milligrams gave it, but low and placebo did not cause an immune response. So you need to give at least 3, mil 3 micrograms and ideally 15 micrograms in order to get the maximum benefit. And uh, you can see that based on the titrated skin tests. Um, there was a much, there was a better response with the 15 micrograms than there was with the 3 micrograms of Feldy one So higher dose is better than medium or low dose cat allergen. So our target dose for cat allergen in BAUs is 1,500 BAUs injected dose. Um, if the extract comes with 10,000 BAUs per mil, well, 10, 1,500 BAUs times 10 is 15,000 BAUs is how much needs to go into this vial. And you divide that by what the extract, what the manufacturer produces, we have to put 1.5 milliliters of cat extract into this vial. Uh, so cat, cat requires a fairly large volume of extract, 1.5 milliliters, uh, in order to give the 1,500 BAUs per injection that we need in order to be effective. So you can see cat takes up a lot of room in the extract. So if you're going to give cat allergy shots, you need to make room for it because it will take up a lot of space. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, other extracts, um, particularly dog now because that's the next thing that is here. And this is a study that Jay Slater did when he was with ALK. He's now the, uh, the director of the allergenic uh, extracts for uh, the FDA. Uh, and um, they took these extracts and they measured the amount of major allergen in terms of micrograms per milliliter. And um, these are unstandardized and these are, um, these are allergen contents in micrograms per milliliter. And you can see that the uh, dog CANF1 only had 5 micrograms per milliliter. That's a very small amount. Um, whereas dog AP dog, this is an acetate precipitate that one, I think Hollister Steer produces, um, 1 to 100 weight per volume contains 140 micrograms per mil. Basically, the acetone precipitate, uh, can if one precipitates in acetone, whereas a lot of the other allergens don't. Um, so, um, this is uh, purified for, uh, for CAN-F1. Basically, if the patient is only sensitive to CAN-F1, this would be a much better extract to give. If the patient's got uh, sensitivities to a lot of other uh, allergens, then it may be better to use whole dog extract rather than a precipitate. And there are ways um, by using component testing to determine which uh, uh, allergens the patient is sensitized to. Uh, when this study was done, those uh, assays were not available. And so for AP dog, if we want to give 140 micrograms per mil, that's how it comes. Uh, it's actually labeled as 1 to 100, but we know that this is how much is in it. We want to inject 15 micrograms uh, of uh, CANF1 into the patient. That, that turns out to be an effective dose. So 15 micrograms times 10, we need 140 micrograms comes as 150 micrograms, it comes as 140 micrograms per mil, so we need a little bit more than one milliliter of this extract to be effective, 1.07. Um, so now that pretty much fills the vial. If you still have 0.08 left over, so we might want to add a little bit of diluent, my preference is to just add a little bit more dog or a little bit more cat and not put in any diluent. Um, but this is how the extract looks when you add the dog. It, it's filled up. And then if you add the diluent in yellow, now we've got the full 5 cc's partitioned off by each component that's in the vial. <clears throat> okay, so we now know what the recommended effective dose is. How much are allergists actually giving? Uh, this is a study, again, I think it was in the early 2000s, Hal Nelson and colleagues uh, surveyed allergists to see how much are they actually injecting into their patients. And this is the effective dose that's rec recommended, and this is the dose that the allergists were actually giving. And you can see for grass pollen, they were doing pretty good, pretty close to the effective dose. Uh, ragweed was being over-treated. Patients were getting more ragweed than they needed, so they probably need to give less ragweed. Uh, for dust mites, it was a little bit underdosed. And for cat, it was also substantially underdosed. So allergists who were told that they needed to increase the amount of dust mite in cat that they were giving to their patients, decrease the amount of ragweed that they were giving, and grass was right on. So keep doing that. 
I mentioned proteases. Uh, some of these extracts do contain enzymes that digest other proteins. And since most of these allergens are proteins, if an extract contains a protease that digests the protein, it might be, uh, become less effective for immunotherapy. Uh, protease content was measured in alternaria, cockroach, and some other molds too. And you can see it's primarily the molds that contain the proteases. Alternaria contains a little bit of protease, but not too much. Cockroach and the aspergillus and penicillium contain a large amount of proteases. On the other hand, pollens, animal dander, and, and these dust mites uh, generally did not contain significant amounts of proteases. It's about as came up with a, uh, a table that this was published in 2008, um, where if, if you want to give a patient an extract with insects, um, it's okay to give it, to add insects to insects. Uh, and you can add fungi and dust mites because the insects seem to be resistant to it. If you're going to add fungi, fungi are resistant to all of these other things. But when you add pollens, then if you combine that with insects and fungi, they tend to interact with the pollen. So you need to be careful about that. So these are this is a compatibility table that tells you what things can be added to what things. Okay, I mentioned that there was an attempt to standardize allergy shots by the uh, practice parameter. Uh, this is a series of extract vials. Uh, this, I actually took this picture, um, so I'm proud of it. It went into the into the paper. Um, but basically, we want the extracts to be labeled consistently. So we recommended, rather than weight per volume, and then try to figure out how much weight per volume is each, each of these things, because not all of the extracts come as weight per volume. Some of them come as allergy units or bioequivalent allergy units. It's, it's very confusing. So basically, the maintenance concentrate should be labeled as one-to-one, -one, um, so there's no dilution. Um, we wanted, recommended that it be vial number one if you're going to number the vials. And we also recommended that the color top should be red. And, and the color motif was basically an attempt to, to imitate traffic lights, green, blue. It doesn't come, up, come out very well on, on this screen, but, but green, green um, yellow, and red. Green, yellow, and red like traffic lights. And because there are four, ex, four concentrations and traffic lights only come with three, we had to come up with another color, and I like blue, so... Um, this one here is blue, although it looks red on the screen. So green, blue, yellow, and red is the color going from vials 4, 3, 2, and 1. 1 is the highest concentration, 4 is the lowest concentration, and then these are dilutions, 1 to 10, 1 to 100, 1 to 1,000 from the maintenance concentrate. Now, if you have a patient who needs a fifth vial, they're extremely sensitive, you can go to a 1 to a 10,000, just label, label that number five and use a silver color. I guess if you need 100,000 full dilution, I, I'm not sure when you would need that. This would vi be vial six. This would be one to 100,000. And I have no idea what color you would use, any color you want, as long as it's not one of these, these four colors. How quickly do these expire? Well, uh, Greg Plunkin also mentioned a little bit about what the, the recommendations are from the manufacturers. Basically, the maintenance concentrate recommended expiration date is between 6 and 12 months, depending on what the uh, original stockpile expiration dates are. Uh, certainly, 1 to 10 and 1 to 100 can be 6-month expiration dates. But as they become more dilute, the expiration becomes shorter and shorter because the proteins are less stable when they're more dilute. So 1 to 1,000 only has a six-week expiration date, and 1 to 10,000, if you happen to make that, we, we don't know. That's, it's not very commonly done, and most of the time, you don't keep it around very long. You get the patient through that 1 to 10,000 dose pretty fast and into the 1 to 1,000 dose, and then you have six weeks to get them into the 1 to 100. Okay, when you give allergy extracts, injections, uh, the most common reaction to allergy shots is, uh, is local reactions. And when I'm talking to my patients about the adverse effects of getting allergy shots, I always tell them to expect local reactions. It's, it's pretty common. Uh, it's unclear whether large locals are predictive of future systemic reactions. It was, it was sort of gospel that they definitely did when I was trained. Now, now there's a lot of question about that. It's really, really not clear that a large local is a predictive of a future systemic. It, it probably has more to do with injection technique than anything else. But if the patient persistently gets large local reactions, consider premedicating them with an H1 blocker. And I, I kind of 
um, routinely tell my patients to take an antihistamine the day of their allergy shots anyway, just to try to reduce that that probability. Uh, a dose of an antihistamine before their allergy shot can reduce the large local reactions. It's also possible to decrease the dose and then build up again more slowly. Um, if the patient's only getting one injection rather than two separate vials, uh, you can split the vials into two different ones and give a half the half the dose in each arm. That's another thing you can do. Systemic reactions are the things that we that we worry about. Um, of course, we all know the symptoms that patients have when they when they experience a systemic reaction to an ex allergy shot. Uh, the most common ones are are hives and a little bit of swelling. It's, particularly at the site of injection. But it's just, to be systemic, the, the urticaria needs to be at a site other than the injection site. They, they may develop respiratory symptoms, which is a sign of systemic reaction. Uh, if the patient says that I have a sense of doom, and, and patients will actually use that word, that, that, that's a scary finding. That, that often happens right before a major anaphylactic reaction. If the patient says, I feel like I'm having doom. Uh, you better get the epinephrine out and start injecting them with the, with the epinephrine. Um, they may just develop severe itching all over their skin. Uh, they may develop abdominal pain and, and cramping. And they may develop hypotension, just kind of feel faint. And that, that could be a vasovagal reaction uh, or it could be an anaphylactic reaction. It may be difficult to differentiate between the two. Most of the time, uh, allergy shot systemic reactions are pretty rapid. Most of them happen within 30 minutes. In some cases, they can happen within seconds, right, right after the, while well, the needle is still in the arm, if the extract accidentally gets injected into a vein or an artery, the patient can start having reactions immediately. Uh, it is possible to react more than 30 minutes after the allergy shot. That, that's not very common, but it does happen occasionally. So you have to decide whether you want your patients to carry epinephrine with them when they leave your clinic on the possible op, uh, possibility that they might react after they've left the clinic, uh, or if you just want to do that with high-risk patients or, or not do it. Uh, there's, a, there's kind of a divide among allergists as to what the practice is. There's no single practice that allergists do. Our clinic, we tend to err on the side of uh, caution, so we, we have all of our patients have epinephrine available, and they, they have to show it to us before we give them their allergy shot. Uh, and we check it and make sure it's not expired. Uh, I've had about five patients in my 35 years of practice uh, that have needed to use their epinephrine after they've left the clinic, but they did, and they went to a local urgent care or emergency room, or occasionally they came back to the allergy clinic, uh, and um, they did fine. And I'm really glad that they had their uh, their epinephrine auto-injector. If they hadn't, who knows what would have happened. I, I just I feel a sense of comfort uh, knowing that I'm protect giving the patients that extra protection. Um, number of injection systemic reactions is actually fairly low, uh, less than 0.5 up to 3.5% of injections. It's actually about less than 0.5% of injections. So it's about 3.5%. Uh, it, it's up to as much as 8 to 9% of patients will have a systemic reaction at some point during their course, but not with any one injection. Factors that favor an increased risk of systemic reactions include if their asthma is not well controlled, if they're really sensitive to the allergen extract, if they're on beta blockers or possibly ACE inhibitors, if you screw up and give the wrong dose, that, that's actually pretty common. Uh, previous systemic reaction puts a patient at risk of a subsequent systemic reaction. If you start a new vial, sometimes the new vial will have more stuff in it than the old vial, so we often will reduce the dose of extract when the new vial is first injected. Uh, and injections given during times when they're having symptoms. If their allergies are exacerbating, they may be at an increased risk of a systemic reaction. Uh, there, ha there are fatal reactions. I tell my patients that there's between there's about two and two deaths from allergy shots per year in the United States. I'm not sure that that's always true. I think it's lower now because there's increased safety that's being uh, practiced. Uh, but but I, but you, it's good to tell the patients that that's a possibility so that they're aware of the need to stay for 30 minutes after the injection. And safety has to be an important issue. Uh, obviously, epinephrine is the treatment of choice for anaphylaxis. This is not a talk on anaphylaxis. I'm not going to go into it, but that's what you do when the patient has a systemic reaction. Well, one other thing I could mention, and I don't think I have a slide on this, 
If you give an allergy shot and the patient ha starts to have a systemic reaction, don't forget that you can put a tourniquet above the site of injection. And what the tourniquet does is it stops the absorption of the extract and can turn off a systemic reaction in progress and give you time to inject epinephrine and, and prepare the patient. And then periodically you can loosen the tourniquet, the systemic reaction is likely to recur, then you tighten it up again and, and it goes away and, and you can keep doing that and giving epinephrine until the systemic reaction stops happening. And that's something that you shouldn't forget to do. That's why we give shots in the arm rather than in the leg or the, the, the butt or the abdomen or someplace else because you can put a tourniquet above the site of injection. How long do you give allergy shots? This is uh, the famous study by Steve Durham. Uh, he basically gave uh, allergy shots, and then he put them on a maintenance dose over a period of time. Uh, and basically, he continued giving allergy shots for three years after the final dose. Here's the uh, response to the allergy shots. And you can see that um, the patients um, who uh, were on a maintenance dose continued to have improvement in their symptoms for at least three years uh, after they discontinued their allergy shots. And it wasn't any difference in patients who stayed on the shot. So here they were on it. The orange discontinued it. The, uh, the, perp, the blue maintained it. And you can see there wasn't a difference. So allergy shots seem to work for at least three years after you stop the allergy shots. And if you give it for a maintenance dose uh, for three years, then the patients tend to have uh, a prolonged remission of their symptoms. We don't know if you give allergy shots for more than three years if, it, if it's any better, but we know that at least three years after discontinuation, you continue to get benefit from the allergy shots. So kind of a whirlwind tour of allergen immunotherapy, and I, I hope this has been beneficial. Uh, I'm going to stop here, and I'm, I'd be certainly be happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thanks, Jay. That was great. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Portnoy? Again, I would remind you, if a patient's having a systemic reaction, don't forget you can put a tourniquet above the injection site, and that will turn it off. I've seen it work amazingly well, and you still use epinephrine and treat the patient and use all caution, but that is something that you shouldn't forget about. So each fellow is going to be asked to write a series of uh, write allergen extracts for your patients, and um, the attendings will, uh, will check your uh, prescriptions and and go over them with you to uh, make sure that, that you understand how to, to write the prescription. But, it, but it's important that each fellow spend some time writing these prescriptions so that you get it. But once you've done the math one time and you know how much to put into a vial, you don't have to do the math again each time. You, you can just use a chart and uh, just know that 0.25 of unstandardized goes in the vial, and, and we, we can write that down for you so that you don't have to do the math each time. But, it, but it's good to go through it at least once. And with that, I'm going to let you guys go. It's really been a pleasure. So um, have take care. Have a great week, everyone, uh, and stay well, okay? Thanks, Jay. Have a good day. All right. Bye-bye.